Hello. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our February catapult on the new topology study capabilities in Simulation 2018. My name is Chris Dubuque. I'm a field technical services manager out of the Portland, Oregon office. It's my pleasure to introduce everyone to Matt Schrack. He's one of our great simulation application engineers from the Denver office. And he's put together a really great presentation for us to go through. Now, before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. I've muted everyone's microphones, uh, so if you have any issues, please send them over to me using the WebEx chat. Throughout the webinar, I'll monitor the chat, so if you have any questions or concerns or anything comes up, just send them on over and uh, I'll address them. Now, speaking about uh, questions, uh, Matt has put together a ton of information for us to go through. So please hold off on, on trying to ask any questions, send them over to a chat. We will have enough time at the end of the presentation to address any of the questions that come up. So we've, we've allotted for uh, a bit of Q&A time. So with that said, I'll go ahead and hand the meeting over to Matt. I am a simulations application engineer. I work out of the Denver, Colorado office. Um, you guys can see my screen, right? Everything looks good here. Okay, so let me just pull this up. So um, I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit today about uh, the topology study, which uh, some of you might know is brand new to simulation um, this year in 2018. So we thought it prudent to uh, develop some content for you guys to give you a quick introduction on what it is, how it works, and uh, demonstrate a few parts for you. So uh, we have the agenda for today. I, I kind of want to take about 40 minutes or so, I think, during my presentation and leave the rest of the time open to questions, as I'm sure there'll be some. Uh, but first off, I'm going to cover packaging, how the topology optimization is packaged inside of SOLIDWORKS and how to attain the capability. Then we'll, the, the, the big chunk of this will be in the setup and capabilities, right? I want to get into SOLIDWORKS, uh, show you guys the topology optimization, how it works, how to set it up, some of its capabilities. Um, but no simulation is complete without applications of it for the real world. So I have some interesting uh, applications that I've developed and how I see this technology getting used. These aren't the exclusive ways to use it, but this is how I see it as of right now. And then I want to compare and contrast it with some other optimization tools that have been available in SOLIDWORKS for a while. So first things first, starting off at kind of a very top level, what is topology optimization? It is a non-parametric mesh-based optimization tool. So what this means is that it doesn't use any CAD uh, dimensions or parametric dimensions to drive its optimization algorithm. So it's really ideal for applications where minimum mass is a concern. This is because it will actually go and take your FEA mesh that you've created and quote unquote remove elements from that mesh that are non-crucial to resisting the loads and boundary conditions we've applied. Now I have remove in quotation marks there um, because it does not actually physically remove elements from the mesh. The way the algorithm works is that it essentially gives those mesh elements zero resistance to uh, deformation. So it removes the, and basically makes them zeros in, in the matrix. Uh, it is based on a linear static analysis, so uh, the same analysis that you have in simulation standard. Uh, and because it's mesh-based, um, your results that you're, you get out of topology study are going to look a little bit more organic than uh, maybe traditionally designed parts. So this is the whole slew of simulation uh, products that I represent here. If you want to move into topology optimization, it is packaged inside of Simulation Professional, right? So in order to use topology optimization, you'll have to check out a license of Simulation Professional or Simulation Premium in order to use this functionality. And again, like I said, it is brand new to 2018. Uh, there is no port or anything, uh, and no standalone version, so we can't take this back to a previous version of, of simulation. You will have to use 2018 in order to use this functionality. But it is really neat, and I highly recommend uh, you guys check it out. So now that we got that out of the way, let's cover some of the uh, setup and capabilities 
um, for the topology optimization. Um, so I, I tried to uh, break this down into some case studies here, and this is sort of the, the, the way that we're going to analyze um, these case studies. As we're going to go and create a study, it's usually best for a topology study to run a linear static study first, so you have kind of a baseline, right? Um, topology optimization is for single parts only. Uh, assemblies and multi-body parts are not yet supported. Also, it is based off of a linear static study. Um, it doesn't have any support for nonlinearities or anything like that quite yet. Um, the benefit of this, though, is you can run your linear static study, get your baseline, and then you can transfer all of those boundary conditions to topology, and then you add a couple manufacturing conditions, and you're well on your way to an optimized part. So the first case study we're going to look at involves a race car, right? This is sort of the ideal application for a topology optimization because they want every part on this to be as light and as strong as possible, right? Uh, if you have a lighter car, you have a better power to weight ratio, you can drive faster. So in this case, it's not like a critically engine critical component, but instead it's this hood latch. Um, we're specifically going to look at this part of the hood latch here. But if you think about it, if we were able to reduce the overall weight of this entire assembly by even 50%, extrapolate that over all the parts in the car, you can make a pretty darn light race car. So uh, that being said, let me go ahead and just jump really quick into SolidWorks here. So this is the part that we're looking at. It's just a mirrored version of the one we saw in the picture there. Um, relatively simple part. So let's go ahead and create our baseline study. Notice I have a few studies down here that have been previously solved. Um, the topology study, since it is an iterative process, the studies can take a little while and nobody wants to sit and watch progress bars. So um, I'm just going to show you guys the setup and then move into the previously solved studies. So we'll just name this static study demo. Oh, maybe demo two. How about that? Okay. And we'll just run through the setup really quick. It's pretty basic. First things first, I like to apply my material. Alloy steel is fine. And then we'll run through our fixtures here. Uh, the way that this part operates in real life is it has a couple of parts that go through it and act as bearings through this area and this area. Oh, let me go ahead and just pin this open and set both of these. Now we have two bearing fixtures on this part here. So it's restrained in all but one degree of freedom. Essentially, it can still move axially through this cylinder. So next thing we'll do is we'll apply a uh, fixed hinge that will act as a bearing, allowing it to rotate, but will prevent it from moving axially there. So that's all we had to do for fixtures for this part. It's pretty basic setup. Next thing we'll do is apply our force load to the opposite side of this going to be in a select direction, notably normal to the top plane here. And the magnitude of this force will just be 200 newtons. Let me actually reverse it so it's going down. All right, so far so good. Now we just have to create a mesh. Uh, in this case, I'll just use a curvature-based mesh um, that's pretty typical for most uh, static simulation analyses here. Okay. So this is our mesh, and like I said, with the topology study, it's always good to get a baseline to know how your part is behaving before you start removing material from it. So we'll just run the linear static study. These run pretty darn quick. Okay, there we go. Now, notice that our maximum stress here is 20 megapascals, but our yield strength is 620. But it looks like it moved a lot. That's just because our plots are exaggerated uh, substantially. So I'm just going to turn off that exaggeration. Uh, you can see here it's been exaggerated 623 times its true scale value. So we'll just turn it back to a true scale and see how it works. You can animate any of these plots for those of you not familiar with simulation and linear static analysis. You can see that it's really not moving all that much at all. So stress is not a major concern on this part, obviously. We're well below our yield strength, um, even with some areas that may or may not be um, singularities in here. Let's look at displacement, make sure it's not moving all that much. Um, again, this is uh, very exaggerated, but we can go and edit the definition of this plot, turn off the exaggeration, and I'll just change the units to 
something with less significant figures here. Um, so we're talking a couple hundredths of a millimeter of displacement. So our stress looks awesome. Displacement's barely measurable. Um, this part is more than strong enough to resist um, the loads that are being applied to it. So it's a really good candidate for the topology study. Now the easiest way I found to access it is to right click your baseline study and this is a new function in 2017 called copy study. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to take um, whatever study you're working on and uh, not only change its um, configuration but you can change its study type as well. So we're going to jump right from a linear static to a topology study here. I'll just leave that name. That's fine for now. So just like that, I'm in a topology study, and it's carried over all my materials, fixtures, loads, and so on from the static study. So that way, even the mesh has been carried over. So that way, nothing has changed. There's no errors in, in translating between the two studies. So all we have to do now in order to get our optimized geometry is uh, add some goals and add some manufacturing controls. Right? So let's first add our goals. You'll see that there's three different uh, options under the goals. There's the best stiffness to weight ratio, which is the default, which we'll use for this one. And essentially what this allows you to do is to reduce your mass by uh, whatever your desired percentage is, or if you know an absolute value you need it to be, you can choose that as well. Um, so in this case, I reduce the mass by 70%, which is pretty substantial. We'll go ahead and accept that. But again, in here you have more options as well. You can um, minimize the maximum displacement in your model, and you can minimize your mass with a displacement constraint, which we'll look at in the next example. So uh, let's add some manufacturing controls. Um, these are kind of crucial for a topology study. By default, it will keep all the faces in which you've applied loads and fixtures, but everything else is free game. So you have to really know your part and know which areas might contact other parts that you kind of need to keep around. In the case of this particular part, we need to keep this area because there's a mating piece right there and a bushing. We need to keep this back area back here. And we also need to keep this front area up here. We have the option to giving that preserved area a depth. So if we know we need to keep that preserved area, I don't know, maybe two millimeters thick, we can do that. And then you can just activate geometry preview. It'll show you how thick two millimeters is um, in relation to the rest of your model here. Um, but I find the mesh element preview to be more helpful. So uh, this is why mesh size is so crucial to a topology study and why changing the mesh will, can pot potentially drastically change your results. So I only have a two millimeter depth of preserved area but my mesh is much bigger than two millimeters. So it's just going to preserve that first layer of mesh around those faces here, um, which, which could potentially, as in this case, be much more than two millimeters. So uh, a finer mesh is generally um, going to produce better results in a topology study, and, and that's the same with any simulation study, really. You know, the finer you make the mesh, the, the better your results are going to look. So really no surprise there. Um, I'll just turn off that preview and check that. Um, last thing we're going to do in this model is we're going to add a demold direction. So what this does is it helps to drive the mesh towards a shape that's more conducive with um, a, a molding type manufacturing process. All these manufacturing controls do is they try to make drive the mesh towards a way that's more easily manufacturable. So I want the mesh in this particular part to be oriented in a way where I could potentially split a mold in this direction. We'll go ahead and accept that. Then all you have to do to, for the topology study now that you've set up your goals and your manufacturing controls is to run it. Again, I have one that's kind of previously done already because it does take a couple minutes. Um, and this is what the results will come out looking like as soon as the study is finished. Give it a second to load here. So this is what the results come out as. The mesh in this model was a little bit finer than in the one I just set up, um, as you can kind of tell. But the, the plot comes out with, with different colors than normal simulation plots do, which is probably a good thing. But the purple 
um, which is sort of on the outside of these, is on the OK to remove side of this plot. And then you can go up the key here. The blues and the teals are a little you know, less OK to remove, but the yellows are definitely must keep to preserve the stiffness to weight ratio of this part. Now, if we go into the definition of this plot, we have a few options. So I'm going to right click, go to Edit Definition. Notice that we have a slider here. Right now that we're at 30% of the original mass, well, kind of towards the heavy end of the slider. So if we take this slider here and maybe move it a little more towards the light side, we got rid of an extra percentage. Now we're at 29% of our original mass um, left over. And it's sort of removed all the purple through the teal elements out of it and kept only the must-keep elements. Notice that it does look uh, very tessellated, right? Remember, this is a mesh-based optimization tool, so it's only keeping mesh elements. So depending on how fine your mesh is, um, it might look like this, or it might look a little bit smoother. Now we do have the option of making this looking a lot better. Uh, down here in this Material Mass Manager, we have a Calculate Smoothed Mesh. Now I already have one of those defined, so I'm just going to exit out of this and go into that. Oh, come on, you silly thing. Let it load here. Um, it is a very tessellated body. Those of you who are familiar with STLs might, might recognize kind of what it looks like here. So this is what the smooth mesh of that other mass plot looks like. Notice that when we zoom in on it, it's still a little bit tessellated, but everything's kind of smoothed out. And you really get a sense of the geometry that SOLIDWORKS has gone and created for us. Right? As an engineer, I, I think these studies are, are really awesome. We've been I've been having a lot of fun developing content for this. Um, I mean, I would have never thought to make little holes like this in here and little uh, you know, organic looking structures like this to reduce that load and so on and so forth. So we can take this smooth mesh and we can um, export it as a, uh, we can export it as um, a new configuration inside of our model or a new part file on its own. It can be exported as just a graphics body, a solid body, or a surface body. So you can actually take this body right here and send it directly to a 3D printer if you have one and print it right off. As a matter of fact, I did that with a few of the ones that we'll see. OK, so that's this part here. Let me just really quickly hop back into my slide deck. So we now went and optimized this guy. Now we're going to look at the second case. So the reason I have two case studies here is our first one is really geared towards uh, one specific loading scenario. So that optimized shape that we just saw is only valid for that one specific type of loading and for that one magnitude of loading. Um, if you change any of that, the shape will change. In real life, um, parts are going to experience multiple loading cases, right? You might have a rest load and a live load and a dead load and so on. Um, so there is support for that inside of uh, simulation. So let me just minimize this guy really quick. And I have this part here. So you'll see again that I have multiple different um, loading cases for this part down here. There's a full load, which entails 800 newtons moving along this sketch line here on those faces. There's a rest load that entails 200 newtons, moving at a little bit of a different line on those same faces. Then there's a side load from the shock in the wheel to the tune of 115 newtons coming in from the bottom here. So those are our three loads. And I do have a uh, combined load study where we make use of the load case manager. This is a uh, function that's available in simulation. Uh, I believe simulation professional, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what it allows you to do is it allows you to uh, dictate primary loading cases um, based on you know, all these different loads. So our first load case is the full load with everything else suppressed. Our second load case is just the, the, the side load or the uh, rest load, pardon me, with everything else suppressed. And then our last is um, the side load from the shock with everything else suppressed. And what this allows you to do just in simulation is make permutations and combinations of these loads to kind of find a worst case loading scenario, right? I mean, you can have as many load cases and combinations as you want. So it's a really nice way of putting everything in one place and finding a worst case scenario.
But what's even better about this is I can, again, oops, go ahead and copy this, again, to a topology study. And the load case manager comes with it now. Um, so we can just go into the study properties here. Whenever you have a load case manager um, active in a topology study, you want to go and use the min-max formulation in the study properties. Since we're in the properties, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the options that are in here. For those of you who run simulation, you might recognize some of these. We, it does still use the in-plane effect, soft springs, or inertial relief if you need to. So those options are still available to you. Um, also, automatic solver selection is still available to you as well. Uh, but what's new for the topology study options is your frozen region settings. As I said in the last study, by default, the regions that are frozen, meaning that's not going to remove mesh from there, are the regions with loads and fixtures applied. But you can change that if you want to. If you want to only preserve regions with your loads applied, you can do that. If you want to only preserve regions with your fixtures, you can do that as well. Or you can do none and really have a lot of manual control over the regions that you want to keep in your model. I keep it on the default where it preserves regions, loads, and fixtures. I don't like the idea of removing material from faces where all of your uh, forces are going through. But if you need to do that, you have the option. So now that we're in here and we have the load case manager applied, let's just go ahead and handle our goals and constraints. In the case of this particular model, we went and minimized mass with a displacement control. Now this is a little bit different than the last model. In the last model we just said reduce mass by X amount and give me the best stiffness to rate ratio. Um, so give me the orientation to give me the best stiffness while removing that mass. And this one's a little bit different. It's, I'm saying minimize mass while maintaining a displacement ratio. So we had a maximum displacement on our combined loads load case manager. We found the worst case scenario. And we found that it's still well within our tolerances, right? So we can actually let that displacement get larger because we're concerned with mass. So think of this box right here as sort of the, the, the point after the decimal as a percentage, right? So we're OK with allowing 30% more displacement in this model and minimize the mass based off of that. Now, it'll automatically choose the point, uh, the single max point of your displacement and base it off of that or you can use or define it if you need to. So that's what we're going to do for this model. We're OK with 30% more displacement. Go ahead and accept that. Um, we'll go and do some manufacturing controls. So we want to drive the mesh to be symmetric, right? This part is symmetric, so we want our mesh to look symmetric. So I'm going to define a half symmetry on this part based on the right plane, right? The part's symmetric about that plane, so we're going to drive the mesh to be symmetric about that plane. Go ahead and accept it. And then I'm just going to turn off my simulation display. Those purple lines can get sort of distracting. OK. Another manufacturing control we'll, we'll add on this one. Again, we'll do a demold direction. In this case, we'll just choose the demold to go this way. And another really neat manufacturing control that I've been messing around with is the thickness control. So this allows you to specify a minimum and or a maximum member thickness. If you remember from the last study, we had a lot of like thin members and structures in, in our model there. You can actually go in here and specify the minimum and maximum um, size of those members to your, to your content. Uh, we're not going to do that on this particular model, um, but you do have that option. So now that you've applied basically the, the two extra boundary conditions needed for a topology study, you would just go ahead and run it. Um, I do have one run already again. And what this is going to give is not only the, uh, the optimized shape for one load, but the single optimized shape considering all the loads in that load case manager, uh, which is really neat. So you don't have to run multiple different studies and sort of figure it out based on those studies. Again, the material mass plot is very similar as the last one. We can edit the definition of it, go a little bit towards the lighter side if we want to. Uh, we were able to reduce the mass by 50% on this particular part, uh, which is also very considerable. Um, so there's that. Let me show you the uh, smooth mesh of that plot there. 
So I calculated the smooth mesh, and it comes out looking something like this. Right? Again, you can export this mesh as a uh, solid body or a surface body. You can take it right to the 3D printer if you want to. But I really think that, that these topology studies are really neat. They come out uh, with some very interesting geometry that as an engineer I would not think of, right, making these little pockets and things like that in here. So let me jump back into my slide deck really quick. Um, we'll do a quick recap, and then we'll kind of uh, start talking about some applications of our results here. So uh, case one, we we're able to achieve a 70% reduction in mass, which is absolutely incredible. Um, 60 grams about originally, and then a little less than 14 after. Notice, though, our displacement went up about 10 times, uh, which is considerable. But we're still talking about a third of a millimeter of displacement, which for this application is probably more than acceptable. Also notice that our yield or our stress went up uh, about 10 times as well. Originally, it was 20 or so megapascals, but now it's up to 140. But again, it's all relative in that our stresses are still well, well below the yield strength of the material. So there's under this loading scenario, there's no chance it's going to break. Right? Case two, we're able to achieve a 50% reduction in mass. Again, our displacement increased quite a bit, um, but still very, very minimal. And again, our stress increased quite a bit, but it's still less than half of its yield. Okay, So you can get uh, pretty pictures like this uh, for your uh, topology studies all day long, but if you can't manufacture it, it's really not worth anything, right? So I'm going to show you guys how to take this to manufacturing applications now. So let me just jump back into SolidWorks here. I'm going to just minimize this part and bring back up our original part that we were looking at. So first of all, under our topology study here, um, we need to know if that shape, how strong it actually is, right? So inside of the topology study, you can do variable stress plots. Now remember at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about how we're not actually removing elements from the mesh, and you can see that evident here. But you can see that the elements that were removed kind of show up in the blue, meaning essentially no stress at all. It's because they're basically zeroed out inside of the uh, actual uh, algorithm. So if you go and you do, I don't know, maybe a mesh sectioning on this, you can actually sort of drag it through and see the elements that, the individual elements that were left in the model and the ones that were um, taken out. Of that again and again, you can do the same kind of thing with a displacement plot here. Again, it's going to show the full model because we're not actually removing mesh from the model. Um, we're just um, we're just zeroing some out. But here's that displacement value that I got on my slide there. But again, like I was saying, this isn't a plot, a body like this, like the smooth mesh body that we have for this part. If you try to hand something like this part over to your machinist, he's probably going to throw something at you, right? Uh, this is not easily um, machinable out of a billet, though it is 3D printable, right? I already showed you how you can export it and, and what have you. So I'm going to go in, back into the model side, into the CAD side of SolidWorks here, and we're going to use a really neat function that's in SolidWorks 2018. We're going to go to View, Display, Simulation Display. And this is available in both parts and assemblies in 2018. So I want to plot my material mass plot as an appearance on this body here. So there it is. Just go ahead and accept this. Notice I'm still in the CAD side of SolidWorks, um, but we're just using the simulation display as an appearance on here. And what this allows me to do allows me to go in and sketch using familiar CAD tools here. Oh, where'd my model go? Um, pardon my poor sketching abilities, I'm a simulation guy, but uh, it allows us to sketch sort of the profile of what the topology study cut out. Right, so we can go through here and use our familiar CAD tools and, and sketch and dimension and what have you and sort of use this as a stencil 
to uh, take off material from this particular model. Now, I'm not going to make you guys sit here and watch me uh, trace that out. I have a configuration in here where I've already sort of done that. Oh, let me uh, get rid of that sketch here and, and show this configuration. So this is the configuration that I made based on tracing that simulation display in our model. Right? If I go in and edit the sketch here, you can see how I've kind of dimensioned some things and, and sort of uh, traced around where the topology study removed material. And overall, this generates a part that's much more um, machinable. Right? These pockets will be pretty easily machined, and same with the outside of this. And uh, we have actual dimensions that we can work with now. Right, so that is kind of the pathway towards a subtractive manufacturing. The additive manufacturing pathway is pretty obvious, right? But let's sort of compare and contrast them really quick. Um, on the additive side, your complex geometry can be exported in your net shape. Um, and that has some advantages, right? You don't have to worry about um, a lot of exporting or importing errors or anything like that. And the real benefit of doing it on the additive side is you have your optimal mass reduction. Right, you have the full 70% mass reduction as of the example of the part I just showed. Disadvantages of that, potentially high upfront cost for the 3D printer machines. Right, uh, 3D printers aren't cheap, um, and especially if you have to manufacture these parts out of metal, uh, metal 3D printers can potentially be even more. Right. Another disadvantage is that if you do have to do any work on those mesh bodies, sometimes they can be uh, difficult to work with for post-processing. Though I understand in Solders 2018, there are some, um, some mesh extraction tools that they just introduced that might make that quite a bit easier. On the subtractive side, your, your complex geometry is simplified, right? You're using your native CAD tools to sort of approximate this geometry that the topology study gave you. And the advantages of doing that are you have native CAD sketches and geometry now. You can actually go in and change the length and change radii and things like that very quickly as you would on any normal part. And that allows you to make simple features like pockets and things like that that are more easily machined than, you know, that, that crazy organic mesh shape. Disadvantages of doing that is you're not removing the optimal amount of mass. Um, and it is more of a manual process. You have to set up this whole topology study. Now you have to trace it and, and cuts and things like that. So it's not as quick as the other way of doing it. And to be honest, I don't think it looks as cool, though it's probably um, more practical. Um, other possible applications, I was sort of thinking about these this morning. Uh, there is the demold tool, which will try to you know optimize the mesh in a shape that is more conducive to molding. So you can, uh, provided the geometry turns out simple enough, you can maybe make a plastic injection mold out of it or possibly do some sand casting. Uh, if the geometry is still fairly complex, um, you might be able to do some investment casting or lost wax casting. Um, or possibly even a five-axis CNC machine could, could handle most of these. So I wanted to bring up a few real-world cases. As I mentioned earlier, I've been having um, a lot of fun with these topology studies. It's, it's a really fun program to use. So here I have the first part that we looked at. Uh, I asked the additive uh, manufacturing engineer here to print up some stuff for me. So we've been going a little nuts. Um, the original shape is here on the left. And uh, to my surprise, it actually turned out almost identically to uh, the metal one that we simulated in um, SolidWorks. The metal one was, I think, 60.5 grams. And then uh, this plastic turned out at right about 60 grams on our shipping scale. So. I was pretty pleased about that. And here is the as-machined configuration. Um, and we were able to reduce the mass by 50%, just like it shows here, and just like it showed in SolidWorks. So that's really cool. Uh, but taking this straight to the 3D printer, we were able to get it down to 20 grams. Now, uh, if you remember from the study, it was actually 70% mass reduction in SolidWorks. And I kind of asked um, Tim, who's a uh, 3D printer guy here, why that is. And he said that some of these thinner members, uh, 3D printers have a tolerance, and some of these 3D members probably printed a little thicker um, than they were in the actual CAD model. But still, a, a two-thirds mass reduction is, is, is still absolutely incredible for this. 
All right, so we've talked about some of the manufacturing applications, showed a real-world case of it I, uh, with some 3D printing, right, and an as-machined configuration. Now let's talk about how it compares to the other optimization tools that are already available to you in SolidWorks and when you might use each one. So as of now, in 2018, there's three optimization tools that are strictly STEM-related, right? There's design studies that are available in SolidWorks itself, um, that do similar things, but they're not explicitly sim related. So in simulation standard, you have what's called a trend tracker. What trend tracker allows you to do is sort of make manual changes to your CAD and rerun uh, simulation studies based on those changes, and it'll track how your stress and displacement and things like that are um, handled over, over time, over those manual iterations. So very powerful tool. Um, I feel like it's a bit underused for those who might have simulation standards. So uh, look it up. Give it a shot. Um, optimization, this is uh, simulation-based optimization, uses basically the same design study. Um, but what we're able to do here is use native CAD dimensions inside of SOLIDWORKS to drive towards a simulation-related goal, whether it be minimize stress, minimize mass, um, have a stress equal to exactly x, or have a displacement less than y. You know, it, it's very, very versatile uh, software. Then we have our topology study, which removes mass to best fit your stiffness to weight ratio, or removes mass to sort of uh, best fit a displacement constraint. So here's kind of a, a quick and dirty comparison of all three here. So again, the trend tracker is in simulation standard. It is a very manual method of, um, of optimization, and its main use is for mass or SIM parameter optimization, right? Stress, displacement, strain, or um, material mass. Um, and what it outputs is a trend journal, which is a collection of pictures and simulation plots um, over your design iterations. Uh, the optimization and the topology optimization are both in simulation professional. Um, they mainly differ in that one is parametric and one is non-parametric or FEA-based. So the parametric one allows you to edit your native CAD dimensions um, towards a goal, whereas the FEA-based one, uh, it just removes mesh out of your FEA model. The main use of uh, regular optimization, I put any in here because it is incredibly versatile. Um, not only does it do mass reduction, but it does basically anything you can make a SOLIDWORKS sensor for. It can optimize to that. And it outputs a native CAD file right, with dimensions and everything in it. Whereas the topology optimization is FEA-based, but it is exceedingly good at mass reduction, right? And its output is the mesh body that you can take straight towards a 3D printer or a reference body that you can sort of hack and slash at um, using it as a stencil. All right, so we talked about that. I wanted to sort of wrap up my portion of this with a few examples that I've, that I've sort of played around with. Um, First of which is my monitor stand at my desk. I did a, an optimization on that and took it to the 3D printer, and it came out pretty sweet. I, I store my stapler and my tape roll under there. Um, this is a, a cool um, mug that I created uh, that has our CATI logo on it that's sort of um, optimized and got the, the crazy little geometry coming off of it there. So that's that one's fun. Um, here's a, a little Y block that we looked at. You see you got the, the fun. Uh, structures built into the center of this. Um, and this is something that we put on a little CNC machine. This is a 3D printed as machined part here. And then this is one that we were able to sort of uh, machine out using a foam um, just to prove that it is still machinable. Um, here's another Y block that I made not too long ago, and so on and so forth. So. A lot of fun examples of it. I've been really enjoying preparing for this webinar. But make sure you check out some of our future webinars going forward. Um, we're going to have one on the 27th about the Roland CNC milling, which is actually what I made that, that foam one out of. Um, and uh, March 15th, we have a kind of a SolidWorks World webcast where we sort of wrap everything in a nice, neat little package and present it to you guys. Um, then from there, we go to top-down modeling. And uh, finally, in late March, we have a desktop metal webcast. This should be quite exciting. So 
I wanted to uh, open this up now for any questions you guys might have. Um, I know Chris has been monitoring the chat. So, um, Chris, you got anything for me in there yet? Yes, I do. I have one, one quick question, Matt, and, and the question was, are there any plans to extend the topology optimization functionality into the flow simulation package? So um, topology study originally came from the Dassault Systems Simulia brand. It was called Tosca and Simulia. And they've, this actually was developed by Tosca and sort of API'd into SolidWorks. Uh, Tosca does have support for the flow simulation optimization. And I, I can't say that they're going to move it into flow simulation, but it seems like everything in SolidWorks simulation is sort of a trickle down from the Simulia brand. So I would not rule it out in the future. That's an excellent question. If anybody has any questions, please uh, fire them into the, uh, the chat. Uh, one just popped up here. Um, any news on if Abacus will become the SolidWorks simulation solver? Um, that was a question that just came in. Uh, that is... Uh, Probably a little bit unlikely. Uh, the SolidWorks Simulation Solver, uh, not a lot of people know this, has actually been around since 1982. It's one of the originals, so it is very well developed, very robust. Um, and the reason that the SolidWorks Simulation Solver is kept in SolidWorks is because of uh, the, te the triangular elements, right, the tetrahedral elements. It's much easier to approximate CAD geometry with those types of elements, whereas an abacus-like solver is more... Um, is more geared towards other types of elements. You can do hexahedral and things like that. Um, let me go, I just had a question come up on mine. He wants to go to the upcoming webinars page here, so I'll put this there. So I don't think that they would in, implement the abacus solver into simulation, but again, I don't have uh, a definite yes or no on that. All right. Any other questions you see coming up? I do not, Matt. Okay. Well, um, definitely feel free to reach out to um, technical support um, if you have any questions or, or, or having a hard time with topology studies when you're moving forward with it. Me or one of the other great members of the SIM team are more than happy to help you out um, with any simulation-related um, questions you may have. So I guess that being said, um, Thank you all for attending, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Yes, thank you very much, Matt, for putting this uh, presentation together. It was very, very interesting and informative. And thanks to everyone that joined our Catapult session. Like Matt said, don't hesitate to give us a call and support. Check our website, cati.com, for any other webinars and events that we've got going on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.